All right, so um, well, thanks, uh, thanks everyone for for logging on. Um, as you can see, it's our first uh, first webinar. Um, so uh, yeah, I didn't know that we were going to have everyone straight in here, but um, it's all all a very big uh, learning curve um, for us. So um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm Barry Cranford. Uh, I'm one of the uh, the founders of of the LJC. Um, now I'm um, I'm not a a developer myself. I am in fact a recruiter. And again, I feel like I just have to wince if I say that on. Um, on an LJC event, um, 12, 12 years on, and it doesn't get any easier. Um, but I actually run a, a tech community company called uh, RecWorks. Um, so personally, I've, I've been on a, a mission for the last 12 years to, to prove that recruitment can actually be a, a power of good in the industry. Um, so the LJC is, is a great example of that. Um, we've used our resources and our network and our reach and, and a bunch of different things to organize uh, 600 events now. Um, just, just like this one, um, I mean, well, these, these were just coming into the first virtual events that we've done, um, but we've been doing this for, for uh, yeah, just, just over 12 years now. Um, my, my personal passion in the whole thing is, is the mentoring aspect uh, and, and trying to use our, our network as, as recruiters to connect mentors with, with people that are currently struggling and facing challenges. Um, another example of that is the Meet and Mentor community, uh, which is a free mentor introduction service. Uh, everyone here is is welcome to to sign up. Um, it's all completely free. I'll drop a link on the notes. Um, yeah, we've made over two thousand int personal introductions on that, and I think a lot of the panel are are mentors on there. Uh, I think most of them. Um, anyway, so that's that's it from me, the LJC, and and me to mentor. Uh, without further ado, I'll I'll hand you over to to Jim, who's going to be hosting the panel from here. So take it away, Jim. Okay, cool. So yeah, I don't have any awkward questions to start off with, but. Uh... Just for everyone on the call, uh, on the webinar, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom meeting. So if you want to put any questions to the panel into there, and then what we'll do is we'll, we'll ask that to, to the guys on the call. So I thought we'd just start by doing a round of introductions. So um, we'll go for each of the panel members, uh, look to describe whereabouts they are with their Java 11 migration. So we could get an idea of uh, where, what, where people are up to, what they found um, sort of interesting so far, and maybe what's stopping um, the the eleven migration, if that's the case for anyone. So we'll do it alphabetically. To be fair, so we'll start with uh, Alex Blewett from Milton Snowy Milton Keynes. Yeah, it's not snowy today, but uh, it was the other day. Um, so yeah, I'll just introduce myself, and then I can pass on to the, the next one from an introduction perspective. <clears throat> My name's Alex Blue. I've been working with Java since it came out in Java 1.0. I've uh, been through a few large organizations that were using Java. Currently, I'm working at Santander in a cloud operative role uh, where I look after their cloud infrastructure. But uh, in the previous roles, I have been involved in migrating uh, large sets of people onto Java 11. And uh, there, there are some interesting challenges that happens when you try and migrate many thousands of applications that perhaps you don't see if you're migrating tens or hundreds. Awesome. Um, and Ben? Uh, yeah, I was going to say I think I'm next. So hi, uh, I'm Ben Evans. Uh, I, I actually live in Barcelona these days, uh, but for many years I, I helped out to, to, to help some of these other fine folk uh, run the LJC. Um, these days I, uh, I'm principal engineer and uh, architect for JVM Technologies at New Relic which is a monitoring and uh, performance uh, uh, application monitoring uh, uh, company. Uh, and we have, we started our journey to Java 11 about uh, a year ago. And it's kind of an interesting challenge um, because New Relic is a very kind of open and autonomous sort of place. So every team kind of tends to do its own thing. And then we're not big on central command and control. So trying to, to manage a migration and, and bring some consistency to, to the process and also share knowledge amongst teams that are very much used to doing their own thing has been an interesting challenge. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, to some of your questions. Awesome, thanks Ben. And Elspeth? Uh, so my name's Elspeth Minty. Uh, I run the Java platform engineering team at Morgan Stanley. Um, I've been in and around Java for probably about 20 odd years now. Uh, since about 2001, um, largely working on, on library development um, and, and various middle, middleware components. Um, so I, I would say we are, um, as an organization, fairly early in the journey to Java 11. Uh, we've been, you know, we've been, it, it's like the, you know, pushing the boulder up the hill. We, we're just starting to kind of get the, get the momentum going, but I, I think it's going to be, uh, 
um, it, it's going to be, I mean, all, the, all these kind of JVM changes and upgrades and they're, they're always quite a, a long process for, uh, for organizations. Awesome, but we'll thanks, I, and yeah, I also work for Morgan Stanley, so I haven't brought you on here to just uh, pressure you, but we'll be interested <laughs> to find out where we're going as well. <laughs> and uh, Martin, how about yourself? Uh, hi, everyone. Yep, I'm the uh, engineering manager for Java at Microsoft. Uh, yes, that sounds strange, but it is true. Uh, so at Microsoft, we actually work on, on Java itself, uh, as well as supporting all of the uh, subsidiaries that Microsoft has in terms of Java, so that's LinkedIn, Minecraft, uh, so on and so forth, plus all of the cloud-based systems that we have with Java. So we are also starting our journey from 8 to 11. It's uh, the Azure SDKs, for example, have made it to 11, but Azure Functions, for example, are, are not. Uh, my other role is I'm the director at Adopt OpenJDK, uh, which is becoming one of the more popular uh, OpenJDK or Java binary uh, kind of vendors, community-based vendors out there. And so we see some really interesting um, stats and discussions around people moving from eight to 11 and then the braver ones going to 12, 13 and 14. Uh, yeah, so can't wait to see the questions. Awesome, so we don't have any questions at the moment, but what, I guess what might be quite useful is um, Ben. So I know New Relic have done some research recently on uh, Java versions and adoptions and also uh, sort of like the different varieties of vendors. I wonder if you'd be able to provide a bit more like, insight to the to the audience on, on things that you found from your research. Sure, very happy to. Um, so if uh, th th there is actually a blog post on the, the New Relic external blog, which covers this in more detail than, than I'm, I'm going to be able to in just a couple of minutes. Um, but basically, because uh, our customers connect to us with a Java agent installed in their JVMs, then for those customers that choose to send us data and choose to share with us, we can actually see what they're running. So we can see the Java version and the Java vendor and essentially all of the command line parameters. So the switches, the heap size, all that good stuff, like from their Java command lines, we will actually get to see. And we're able to aggregate that um, and to, to, to look across all of our customers. Um, and obviously that's not a perfect representation of the Java market, but it is, it is you know, indicative, I think, of, of, of some parts of it. Um, and from that, we're able, to, able to, to, to see some quite interesting things. So for example, what we see is that um, 11 adoption compared to eight is, is steady and growing, um, but eight is by far and away still the majority of the, uh, of the Java market. Um, to Martin's point that he, that he made about, about braver people going not just to 11, but to 12 and 13 and most recently to 14, we find that those populations, the numbers of people actually adopting anything beyond 11 is, is quite small. So, so just in case you don't know, Java 8 and Java 11 are what are called long-term support releases, which means that they, they are maintained by the community. Oracle changed their model about a year ago, so they only actually do six months of support for each version of Java. Um, but a couple of the versions, 8 and 11, have been adopted by Red Hat and some other folks um, and adopt OpenJDK. Uh, and they are actually supported for the, for the long term. So if you don't want to pay for support and you want to, to stick on a version which is going to continue to get, to get security upgrades, what we're seeing is people are, are staying on 8, and if they are upgrading, they're upgrading to Java 11, which is the other long-term support release. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so we just had a question come in then from, uh, from the audience, which is uh, for those moving to Java 11, um, what is the uptake on the JPMS or the module system in Java? What, what have people seen around that? Um, any kind of, <laughs> I see a few people smiling. Um, we'll, we'll answer that one now. Uh, well, I guess I can jump in and throw an observation that the JPMS um, was actually really great for modularizing the JDK. Um, it split apart a lot of long held dependencies. It allowed things like Java SQL to be moved out from what was part of the standard distribution into its own package uh, and some of the other libraries as well. So as far as modularizing JDK goes, JPMS has been excellent. And in particular, if you're running on a Dockerized or containerized environment, then using JLink to be able to shrink down the JDK throughout the libraries that you're not using has been a great benefit. So I think if you were talking about using JPMS as in taking advantage of the fact that the Java 11 module system 
allows the JDK to be more partitioned and shrunk down to size, then I think, yes, people are using it. If you're talking about people using JPMS to actually build applications, I think the answer is probably not. Now, what's been happening is that as uh, Java 11 has become more popular, libraries have started adding JPMS module information so that they could be used within those um, modules if they needed to. But I would say that you're not seeing applications being built to be able to um, take advantage of the JPMS module system from an application perspective, at least in terms of what I've seen. There was an interesting stat which came out, I think it was actually just this morning. Someone has done some analysis. I, I actually need to go back and find the link. And if I find it, I'll post it to the channel. Um, the, the, someone's done some analysis of what's present on Maven Central, which is which actually is, or was it actually GitHub? It might have been GitHub. Uh, it was on a big <laughs> site, which basically tracks the, uh, tr tracks the uptake of modules. And it's something like about four to 5% of what they see uh, is currently modularized. In, in the library space. So that, that's different to, as, as Alex says, the usage in the JDK uh, itself. Um, now, what, what I, I would say about, about J, JPMS uptake is it's not something we see directly in the New Relic stats. Um, but one thing which is, I think is pertinent is that as of right now, even with Gradle 6.3, Gradle does not build modules out of the box. It's not until hopefully the next release, Gradle 6.4 in a month or so, the, the, the Gradle ecosystem will actually even support modules natively. Um, and Gradle is a huge part of, of the Java ecosystem. So that, that lack of modular support in one of the two major build tools, well, I don't think it's really helped very much. I, I mean, as, as a library developer, the for me, the driver to move our, our stuff to Java 11 is, is the modules. Um, and particularly, like Barry said, for the uh, for cloud adoption and containerization, it's it's just it, it's such a big win to be able to to minimise what some of what are turning out to be fairly chunky builds. And we yeah you know, we are uh, you know I, saying that we're we're not really doing much much with uh, with Java 11 is is true at the moment, but pretty much all our new development is is Java 11, um, and that's you know the, this is one of the reasons why for us. Yeah, so one of the things we're doing at Adopt Open JDK is we're actually uh, kind of got a, um, a project going on, which is tracking um, Java 9 module adoption at Maven Central. So that's uh, one of the folks at Adopt who's tracking that. Uh, it is about uh, 6,300 modules now who it insides uh, Maven Central that have uh, modular support. Um, I just posted a link as well to the Gradle issue where, it's, where they're gonna have support for it in 6.4 as, as been mentioned. Um, one of the interesting things that we're looking at doing at Adopt as well is building an API, uh, an online tool, so a website, but also an API where folks can actually come in and uh, J-link, so create these minimized runtime builds uh, in any, any type of manner they see fit. So I think, <clears throat> I'll, I'll be blunt here, I think Oracle made a, a bit of a mistake here uh, in terms of uh, deprecating the JRE build. Uh, without replacing it with a tool that developers could use readily to build a modular based runtime. Uh, and I think because there's been that kind of tooling gap and education gap uh, and IDEs haven't really supported it out of the box, uh, that, that's one of the reasons for the incredibly slow, slow adoption. Uh, and I, I won't deep dive into the other technical challenges that uh, some folks models, I think models have. That's a, that's a cafe conversation. Cool. Right, thanks, everyone. Um, so the next question that's coming in is, what would you say the biggest challenge you've faced for, for those of you who've moved to 11 from Java 8? What were the, um, I, I like how this question is posed, how, you know, moving from 8 to 11, I'm guessing, would, would, would you be able to comment and kind of be stopped at 9 or 10 along the way? Or was it just a, a straight, straight big jump? We, we didn't stop. Um we're not stopping or we haven't stopped at, at 9 and 11 and we we haven't seen much within our user community but we are seeing up uptake of um 13 and 14. um yeah we we were having requests to to bring 14 in-house the day it was released um and people people are uh you know, people are in production on on 13 uh which is it's great but i think it's also in some ways it's, it's slowing the interest in, in Java 11 for us. Um, the people who really want to 
um, you know, be on the cutting edge and, and trying things out, they're, they're not interested in 11, they're interested in 13 or 14 now. Um, and I, I think that's that we're seeing less uptake of Java 11 because of that, because um, the people who are more conservative and want to see that it's working beforehand uh, are not interested in going to uh, in going to 13 or 14. They want 11, but they're not seeing enough usage of it. I think it's it's going to be interesting to see whether that is just um, a kind of shift in direction. Um, with the you know the change in the release strategy from Oracle, whether it's a side effect of that, or whether we're going to see the same with with seventeen as well, um, but it's yeah it, it's an interesting uh, interesting thing. We we've got people on fourteen and people on uh, on eight, a lot of people on eight, but very few people on eleven. I'm gonna. Um, I think. Well, sorry, Ben. Go ahead. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to spin the question slightly on its head. Um, I think the biggest challenge um, for people moving to 11 from 8 is actually realize, getting them to realize that it's not a challenge or a bad thing at all. Yeah. Um, if, if you have um, Java applications, especially microservices, anything which is containerized, it's an opportunity. You are leaving stuff on the table by not moving. And that's the challenge is to get people to understand that there is so much benefit available by coming to 11 that, hey, why wouldn't you? Um, I'm sure this is going to provoke some further questions about, about what, what those benefits are. So let me just head that one off at the pass a little tiny bit, although I'm sure there's plenty more to dig into. Um, so, so benefits are um, early versions of eight, especially it's better in the later releases, but if you haven't updated for a while, your eight applications do not work natively with con con containers. It doesn't see correctly how many CPUs you have. It doesn't really understand about the memory limitations, those kind of problems. Um, you, with, with 11, you actually get proper container support, which actually deals with things like CPU quotas. That's just there out of the box. Um, as Alex was talking about, with the ability to, to run modularly, that's a terrible word, modularly, um, it, what, what you can do is you, you now don't have to bring in a full 100 plus, K, uh, 100 plus meg of a, a full RT.jar. You can actually just bring in a few basic modules. So your, your, your containers are smaller, they start up faster. Um, there's a whole bunch of improvements in things like the JIT compiler, which suddenly gives you um, better performance for things like SSL. Um, modern versions of SSL still have to be backported to 8, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There is a whole shopping list of things which you, you're totally missing out on, many of which are relevant to containers by not coming. I was going to say that one of the reasons that we um, saw people moving from 8 to 11 was primarily due to the licensing changes that Oracle made in some of their subsequent releases. And so there is the desire, if you have a large organization, not so much of getting people onto 11, but getting people off um, JDK 8, or at least Oracle JDK 8, because there were um, updates and other security issues that might require Oracle support contracts to execute in production if you were using those. So in, in some cases, the migration of uh, Java 8 to Java 11 wasn't so much of a jump to as a push from because of those changes. And that's something I think that uh, people might have noticed. Um, certainly there were more challenges going from 8 to 11 than there have been going from say seven to eight or six to seven and so that has slowed the changes down but primarily if you were moving from oracle jdk 8 to uh, open jdk 11 for example then there was a set of testing that you needed to do across a very large portion of an organization in order to be able to migrate those things forward um yeah, so I think the biggest challenge I've seen for folks is that there are a lot of really, really old core libraries and frameworks in the Java ecosystem, uh, which either lost their authors um, or were using uh, interesting tricks in some misc unsafe and other hidden internal libraries, or we're doing bytecode manipulation or some other, some other exciting thing like that. And because in order to be able to use Java 11 with the restrictions that Java 9 put in in particular, um, it meant that if you've got one of those libraries or frameworks in your dependency stack, 
and hello anyone who's using like an application or a web server you're in a, you're in a world of hurt at this point uh, you were you were either forced to go in and start working with that open source community to or that library or framework was it to go and, and upgrade that library and fix the issues uh, or, you, or you simply had to try and upgrade the library to the latest version so uh, this is turtles all the way down basically um, you have to almost start at the bottom of your dependency tree and make sure that that library or framework has got Java 11 uh, support uh, and then builds all the way up on top of it. So uh, I think I saw a question in the Q&A as well about how should I start? And I said the simple way to start is to grab your Gradle Maven or Ant build tool if you're still using Ant. I know there's one of you out there. Uh, go and upgrade all your dependencies to the latest versions because most of the work that's been in, done in the past two years for those libraries is generally Java 8 to Java 11 migration type, type activities. Once you've stacked up all those dependencies, run your build under 11, see what breaks and start patching things one by one. And, and it is a slow, laborious task, unfortunately. Cool. Um, so I think that probably also covers the, the third party question about libraries. If you've got 100 plus, what's the best way to, to do the migration? I think that probably would have been harder a couple of years ago, but maybe just starting and seeing what, what kind of challenges you're going to face is the, is the best way of kicking that off. I don't know if anyone else has any further advice on hundred libraries of hundred plus dependencies and migrating to 11. Um, okay. So one thing you can do is you can have a look for kind of known bad libraries or at least libraries that weren't updated. So if you've got uh, something like ASM, uh, ASM was one of the later bytecode manipulation libraries to gain Java 11 support. So if you've got dependencies on ASM that are less than version seven, or you're using BCL less than 6.2 or ByteBuddy less than 1.9, then chances are you're going to run into some of those issues. Most build systems will allow you to get a dependency graph of everything that you depend on. And you can then look for known issues with that. But actually, if you've got lots of dependencies, probably the best advantage, uh, the best thing that I can suggest is just first try by upgrading your dependencies. Because chances are, if you are upgrading from you know, Spring 4 to Spring 5, or you're upgrading uh, your build tools from Gradle 5 uh, to Gradle 5, Gradle 6, or whatever, then quite a lot of these things might already be understood. And so rather than saying okay well i need to look for this particular library and then figure out how to get that update into my tree it's probably easiest just to check that you're running on the latest version of your dependencies anyway and when you've got a big project the way that you do that is you just update your leaf nodes independently so you know do one dependency build and test do another dependency build and test and then once you've got to everything running on the latest version then you can start looking if there's kind of known flags that you need to look out for uh, but i think mo by now most libraries that have uh, updates that will allow you to run on Java 11. The only times which you are likely to run into problems, as Martin said, is if you've got a dependency where you were depending on a project that went mothballed you know, seven years ago, and it just happens to have worked ever since. Uh, because things hadn't changed. So that's the only time where you might need to move, you know, from say one mocking framework to another mocking framework. Or if you're using a unit testing library, maybe you need to move to a, a more up-to-date one like TestNG or JUnit or something along those lines. The ones where effectively open source abandonware means that the developer hasn't been doing any changes, then you might find that those are some of the problems. But just upgrade to the latest and then incrementally fix the issues that you find. Yeah, it's particularly interesting you mentioned ASM and then by code manipulation. We, we've just actually gone through an exercise in, in Apache Maven um, of upgrading to Java 15. So all of the builds that they do on their CI side of things is using pretty much as soon as 14 comes out, we start building with 15 to see if there are any issues. And again, this is a, another project that has hundreds of libraries that are involved in the dependency chain. And that, that's usually ASM dependencies are things that break first because the fact that we build with 15 almost like the next day exposes that ASM needs to catch up. So yeah, definitely, definitely seen that as well, even with, with sort of the later versions. Uh, ben, I think you had something to add as well. Um, I did, but, I, but before, before I do that, I just want to come back on your points and say, first of all, thank you and all the folks in the Apache Maven community for making sure that you do keep track with, with the betas, um, waiting for Gradle to, um, to catch up and actually start being able to build Java 14 apps has been like pulling teeth. So, so thank you for that. Um, there's also the side question about whether actually ASM is really the right way to, to do this going forward or whether we actually really at some stage need a proper bytecode manipulation library that's actually in the SDK. 
Um, but hey ho. Uh, I was just going to riff on what Alex was saying about about building from the the leaf dependencies upwards. Um, you can do it that way. One thing which I've I've found is actually sometimes these you know although it's daunting because you think wow I've got a hundred plus libraries in my dependency graph. Um, sometimes it's just not that daunting. Just try it. Just just upgrade it uh, and see what breaks. There'll be things which rely upon ASM, um, but effectively regarding it as a lockstep upgrade between the, the JDK version and also of your libraries and thinking of that as one upgrade actually means that it, 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 what, you, what you know you're doing is a full effective um, retest and you're kind of unfreezing all of your dependencies and then, and then trying to find a combination which is going to work again. Um, there will potentially be clashes between transitive dependencies because it's Maven and there always are. Um, but treating it as a, just a formal upgrade exercise, we upgrade the SDK, we upgrade the libraries at the same time, uh, we found to be quite productive. I, th I think that's a really important point. It's not that there aren't that many issues that people are seeing with, with language upgrades. It's you know, the, the, big, the big problems, are the, or not problems, but where, where the work is going in is upgraded the library versions. And whether you're on eight or eleven or whatever, it's 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 those changes that are taking the time. Um, I just want to uh, add one sort of concluding thing on this as well, which is that um, when you are moving from Java eight past Java nine to any future version, that's where the transition issues have been seen with some of these libraries. Going from Java eleven to the next LTS, which I think is Java seventeen. I don't expect we'll see nearly as many of these problems. But I also want to flag up ASM. I know we've mentioned that a couple of times and we said you need to be on version seven and so on uh, before you can do these things. Um, I want to say ASM is a great library and there are a lot of libraries that build on top of tools like ASM, BCL, ByteBuddy and so on. And they aren't the problem, they're just like the canary in the mine that has flagged up some of these issues. Like Jim was saying when uh, Maven was upgrading to build with JDK 15. Um, so ASM itself is a great library. It's not ASM's fault that these changes were there. And the ASM and BCL Byte Buddy libraries have been, authors have been really um, on the ball in terms of being able to move forward when new versions of Java have come out. But they are the first in a chain of things that need to be done. So that tends to be why you find the issues with them first, because they're so close to the metal in terms of these things. But I don't want to don't want people to go away thinking that ASM is the problem. The ASM authors are doing a great job. They're just the canary in the mind that finds out the issues first. Yeah, definitely. I mean, just to add to the the, the experience that we had, you know, we, we have a ma massive number of integration tests on Maven. One of those failed with, as, as a result of ASM, but the new version of ASM was out within the week that fixed the bug and closed the Jira. So, you know, it was, it was purely, as you say, it's with that probably being the first, probably one of the first libraries to start running betas against 15 and, and why, that, why that flagged up. Okay, cool. Um, Here's a, here's a pretty interesting question. Um, why do we have non-LTS releases? You know, I, I kind of remember the days where you'd look forward to the next major version of Java and then now you turn around and it's been free while you've been uh, doing something else, especially over summer. Um, I guess, yeah, does anyone want to provide any insight into why we've gone down the path of, of changing the release cadence? Okay, I'm gonna say something moderately controversial. <laughs> Uh, which is you'd, you'd have to ask Oracle that one to get a, a straight answer. Um, and to be, be more exact, you would have to ask people who work, used to be Oracle executives and are now no longer uh, and now work somewhere else to get a, a, an honest answer as to, to why they, why they, they, they are. Um, the less flippant answer is basically to compare the technical approach of the old release system and the new one. Um, in the old days, we had... Um, what, what I sometimes call a capstone release model, where there's one big feature which is really important and really defines that what that release makes up. Okay, so you, you probably think, you know, Java 8, it was lambdas, right? Java 9, it was modules. And the way that that feature was developed is it was basically mostly developed on mainline. So some initial exploration would be done in branches, but once you actually started to converge towards the release, all of your commits are effectively happening on short-lived feature branches, which ultimately land on mainline. So on mainline, there is an incomplete version of the feature, which is maturing and getting ready for release. Okay, seems fine. What happens if you discover a serious problem 
you know, a P2 or a P1 bug close to release in that model. You delay the release because you can't do anything else, right? You can't ship in the current state because head is not releasable. So you get these, these big features which mature in, in mainline, um, but the cost you pay for that is that if there are issues, your release date has to be the thing that flexes. In the new model, which is, the, and so just to be clear, the capstone release model was used to deliver Java 8 and Java 9. But when Java 9 shipped, the release model switched. So for Java 10 and onwards, a strict time-based release model is followed. So now the main line is always releasable. You can do a panic emergency release of, of, the, of the open JDK at literally no notice, because at least in theory, the, the head of, of, the, uh, of the, the, the main branch is, is ready to go at all times. And instead, you integrate your features when they are feature complete and when they're basically pretty close to being able to ship, ship and not before. So what that now means is you can ship on a predefined schedule. Now, there's no free lunch. So if you missed the window, you missed the cutoff date for integrating your patch set, tough. Come back in six months. So it's about a trade-off within two different development models is, is the, the technical and non-flippant answer, at least as I understand it. Uh, so maybe I can add some thoughts on this as well, again, in a non-professional and uh, unknowing environment. But um, when the earlier versions of Java were released, they went on a kind of two-year schedule or something along those lines. There was an impact when Sun bought um, when Oracle bought Sun that took a long time between that and when the next version of Java came out. And partially that was to do with the legal aspects of, uh, of the company changing. But that sort of impacted the release every two year um, mantra. And there was, it was felt quite a delay between five and six and six and seven coming out for, for those reasons. Um, there has been a gradual change in the industry to do more agile based development and when you have agile based development you have the sprints or the or the um, units that you're deploying to with the idea of having something that's deployable at the end of that and projects like eclipse have been using the date based release model for quite some time where as ben said if you miss the train because your feature isn't ready yet then it just doesn't go in and it slips to the next version but you slip the features rather than stopping the release dates of what goes on and that was seen as attractive to oracle what they then did was they then moved to a six-month release model and the problem is when you move to a six-month release model you're releasing two new versions a year um, previously the versions that oracle supported were at least until the last one had run out plus six months more but if you're releasing every six months that gives quite a support overhead involved to the projects and so i think they realized that moving to a six month release model and moving to this dated release of the set of features that were ready at the time was a great way of picking up the speed of delivery of the Java applications, but that they couldn't then support every release that goes out from there. So JDK 9, for example, was a great proving ground for showing that modules worked, um, but Java 9 isn't really supported anymore. Uh, so they had to pick some sort of milestones of these releases of which ones that they were going to offer as long-term support options to their clients quite why they picked the release dates that they did i don't know um, they might have decided that they wanted to do something uh, similar to the way ubuntu works and ubuntu although it has regular releases designates its april releases in even years as being the long-term support models so 2004 is ubuntu's current long-term support model and i think they probably just took the experience to a whole bunch of other open source communities and then applied it to the Java platform. What I think it has done, uh, because the tip of Java is always deployable, um, is it means that we've been seeing new features and new JEPs being added at a rate far faster than at any other time in Java's history. So it's been great from that point of view. But I personally think that the way you should think about the version numbers is Java 11 as being the production version and Java 11.next as being Java 17. And yes, we've got 13 and 14 and 15 and other such things in the meantime, but treat them as, as um, release candidates. Treat Java 14 as being release candidate one for what Java 17 will be. Um, and actually getting it out to people earlier is great because as um, Jim noted earlier, 
we see that there are occasionally some issues some libraries have to be updated. In the case of ASM, it's not so much that new bugs are discovered as much as they're adding new bytecodes and the way that they deal with sealed types and records and uh, nestmates and so on has, has meant that the bytecode parsing libraries have just had to learn new stuff to be able to do their work. Um, but by making sure that you release something on a regular cadence that is always in a releasable state means that we're able to deliver those things through as a pipeline quicker, get them out in front of people, potentially break things and then fix those things so that when the next major release, LTS release works, then you've ironed out all of the problems before you've got there. And that's why people like Mark Reinholds are doing, you know, work screen on Java 14 or whatever the current hashtag is that he's asking people to test. I'll just add one little bit to that. I mean, I think Alex covered this really, really well, but there, there's there's also a sense of, I wouldn't quite say panic at, at the top of the Java ecosystem, but all of the vendors involved in Java and, and Open JDK, uh, we're starting to get a little bit concerned to, uh, as well around kind of developer productivity and developer adoption of Java. And this may sound crazy given the, the numbers that we have today, but if you look at the, the average uh, age range of, of Java engineers, and if you look at the rate of adoption of new engineers coming to the industry and going to Java as opposed to going to other language ecosystems such as Node and Python, uh, for example, uh, you see the numbers dramatically dropping off. Uh, unless these young graduates are going into enterprise software companies and are being quote unquote made to work with Java because that's the existing stack that's there. Um, a, a lot of these younger generation, they prefer the more modern, uh, not more modern, the faster moving, uh, faster moving languages. Now that might be right or might be wrong. It's just actually usually a perception thing if you've been in the industry long enough. But um, it, was, it was starting to become a concern that, that, that Java was just going to become pigeonholed as, as this kind of old enterprise only technology. And, and uh, we needed to publicly figure out a way of actually changing the story there. All I'm saying is just don't look at the presenter's color hair in this conversation. Exactly. <laughs> on point, Alex, on point. That's why we need Barry to put his video back up. <laughs> so actually, Martin, while, while, you're, while you're speaking, I think another thing um, that would be useful to, that I was thinking of was how, how vital are programs like Adopt OpenJDK and where can the LJC and other community members get involved? So like we're biased. We of course think Adopt is was critically vital. Um, I think we're up to almost 200 million downloads now. So I think the the market has responded with with the need for what we were producing, uh, and that really was about providing a vendor neutral place to produce open JDK binaries of a reasonable standard. Uh, and now that reasonable standard has gone up to be a very high standard thanks to the testing quality kit that we've got. Um, so. We think it's a really important service. We think that every Java developer in the, around the world in particular needs to have access to a free, well-built open JDK binary. Um, you know, it's up to companies whether they want to buy commercial support or not off other vendors. That, that's not a concern of ours. Our concern was to make sure that the entire ecosystem could still grab binaries and not be penalized for it. Um, it is heavily backed by the LJC. Um, so a whole bunch of the core committers uh, and help kickstart the project in the first place and continue to work on it today. Um, and we will always happily take on more volunteers and there's, there's some great documentation and help to get people started. I'll type the URL into the uh, window. And let me let me pick up on that. So um, obviously I, I put the link to the new Alec uh, research into the into the chat window. Um, I, oh, and I suddenly realized I've, I've, all of my stuff I've been putting in here has gone to only gone to all panelists. That's not very good. Yeah. <laughs> Let me, uh, yes, the old Zoom chat. Technology. <laughs> That's great. Well done. Well done, Zoom chat. That's a wonderful default. Um, so let me try again. So now in the sidebar, you will find a link to our research where we talk about, about um, the, not only the different versions we see, but also the vendors. And as you'll see, Adopt Open JDK is after Oracle, the largest provider of, um, of, of Java binaries that we see in our data set. So effectively, after Oracle, the, the second largest provider in the world. What I can also say um, is I, I didn't publish these numbers because they're drawn from a slightly different sample set and technical reasons. Um, but I actually have been monitoring those numbers for a lot longer than just what's reported in the, in the report. And I can see that, that uh, Adopt Open JDK's trend is very, very strong indeed. Um, it's continuing to rise and it's, it's, it's come up very strongly in the last few months. So 
I mean, my my advice, and you know, again, full disclosure, New Relic are a supporter and a sponsor of Adopt Life and JDK. Um, we we I, I think that that basically that should be your starting point if you're trying to move on to open jdk and come to come to java 11 i i think adopt is the place where you start you may you may decide you want to pay for support you may have some other reason for ultimately not going with adopt but it's it's a great default position to have yeah i mean it's it's a great it's a great project we it needed something like that if that wasn't there i, I think it would it would be um, quite a different landscape, maybe for for Open JDK, because it's it it it's so well tested. Uh, it makes it, it really makes a big deal. Um, the I think there's also it's it's not just the JDK. It's it's the Docker images that they provide as well with with the JDK and with the uh, with companies like like Pivotal VMware VMware. Um, you know that when you listen to them talking about how you know a lot of stuff about how to use um spring on on docker what the thing that they always say at the start is our recommendation is is adopt open jdk this is where we test um and knowing that there is there is something there that um that companies like uh or software like like spring is is testing on you know it's going to work there it gives it gives you a really good starting point Everything we do, by the way, is completely out in the open. So you can even take the entire infrastructure of, of Adopt Open JDK and you can run your own Java build farm, whether it be on your laptop or inside your organization. So for folks who need to have chain of custody over their source, um, feel free to big borrow and steal. And we know there are several large Fortune 500s which are doing exactly this. Um, and and it's, great, it's great for us, right? It keeps our scripts open and honest and, and, and not too hard coded things. It's great. Cool. So, so going on back to the, the language question, we've opened a can of worms now by saying, you know, Java, Java's aging. And uh, the question that's come in is, is, do we think that alternative JDK languages such as Kotlin uh, will receive greater adoption in the years ahead? I think this is kind of saying, does it really matter if Java's an old language? You know, one of the main powers here is with the, the VM. Well, Jim, as, as you know, this one is a particular favourite of mine. So I, I hope I can. I hope I can go first. Um, I think you may have to. You may have to compete with Martin, who's rubbing his hands together as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely going last. <laughs> so, so okay. So there's a, there's a, there's a question. Um, does it matter if Java is an old language? Well, let me ask you this: Does it math matter if Python is an old language? Apparently not because it suddenly got super popular again in the last few years. And I think I'm right in saying that Python is actually older than Java. Um, and there's actually a quite an interesting distinction between the two languages here, because while Java, I mean, it has, has evolved and it's taken on some, some ideas from computer science, it's definitely taken on other influences, but the core of the language, the object orientation, the basics of the type system and stuff is still very much recognizable um, to, to Java 1.0. Um, whereas Python has undergone some radical changes uh, and is actually now quite a different language to the one that I, I used to know, you know, almost uh, almost 20 years ago. So it's not, so on the, on, on the one hand, the, the answer to the question, does it matter if Java is an old language, is no. Um, it, it, I don't think it does. I don't think it does matter that it's been around for a while. Um, what it is, is battle tested um, and very solid uh, and Yet at the same time, it's proved that it can evolve and to bring in you know ideas which are are, are becoming fashionable again in, in computer science. Um, and also bear in mind that that, that um, a lot of the ideas in languages like Kotlin and Scala, which people talk about because this is the JVM ecosystem, that people think of as coming from those languages, actually were not invented there. Right. So, for example, Scala's approach to type inference is totally not unique to Scala or Kotlin. You know, you might go and talk to the people who write Haskell about how they feel about type inference, for example. Um, so, so that's that's the you know the, one of the great things about about the programming language communities is that successful languages do the Steve Jobs thing. You know, great artists steal ideas get get chucked around and and um, translated into a form which which in successful and popular languages the idea is molded to fit the shape of the language. So type inference is a good example. Java's type inference is purely local. It's nothing like as extensive as it is in Scala or Haskell, but the way that it's implemented in Java fits the Java language itself. 
So that's the first question, which is about the, the age of the language and, and where ideas come from and, and how languages influence each other. Um, the second point is that there's an assumption. The real value lies in the JDK and the JVM. And that's an assumption. That's an assumption. That's not, that's not something which we necessarily see in the data. Um, so you can, you can think about you know, the growth rate of Java as, as a language versus the growth rate of other languages like Scala and Kotlin. And you can think, okay, a relative rate of increase versus an absolute rate. Java is so large and there are so many new developers coming into to software generally that you might expect, well, okay, Java is still adding a lot of people to its ecosystem, and it is, um, because the entire software market is growing to such a huge degree. But then you might think, but maybe what's happening is people are coming and languages like Scala and Kotlin are displacing Java and that therefore they have an, a massively you know, huge relative growth rate. And while it's hard to estimate, that doesn't actually seem to be the case. Um, Kotlin is kind of a special case though, because of course that has Android um, and Google for, for many reasons, um, not least of which might be the fact that, oh, they're involved in a massive lawsuit against Oracle over Java. They might have very, very sound reasons to want to have a language which was Java compatible, which used that ecosystem, which tapped into that market of developers of, of Java programs uh, on Android, and to move them onto a language which was related and very similar, but definitely distinct. So, so, so you can't really divorce the, the question of the popularity from Kotlin from the Android question. Uh, and outside of that, we need more data, um, but I think people might actually be surprised by, by the answers to that. It's by no means clear that the received wisdom that actually there's a load of growth in, the, in, in non Java languages and not that much in Java. Um, that's not necessarily borne out by, by the data that we do have. Um, I'd like to point out that the whole idea of the Java being popular is really a function of the JVM and Java or JVM and Java and JDK. It's really not a language thing as much as a combination of the above. And in actual fact, things that have been driven into the JDK, uh, like Invoke Dynamic, for example, was added in Java 7, but you couldn't use it from Java in Java 7. It was there as a bytecode and the JVM supported it and uh, Charles Nutter used it for the uh, work that he's been doing on JRuby, but Java the language couldn't take advantage of that until Java 8 happened when lambdas were built on top of that. And now we're seeing um, the uh, conditional dynamic uh, strings, which have been added as bytecode as well, and we start to see method handles being added. A lot of these things are v JVM, uh, JVM things that have been added, which have then benefited all languages. And as Ben said, I think Kotlin in, is becoming increasingly popular due to its presence on the Android uh, phone ecosystem. And of course, phones are going to overtake laptops and servers at some point anyway. But um, the Java, the language, and Java, the runtime, and Java, the libraries, and the JVM itself is, is a combination of things. So when people talk about Java, they really mean a, a combination uh, of, of those bits and pieces. I would also say that competition between languages is good because I would say that since Java generics were added into the language, there wasn't much appetite within Oracle to actually change Java the language to be able to do things. And I think the existence of Scala and Kotlin and various other libraries that run on the JVM have encouraged the uh, investigation of new features. Um, in particular, the Graal VM, which I know is Jim's topic, so don't get him started on it, um, is something which will allow you to run multiple different language types on top of the JVM. And that was partly there just to so, show the power horse of the JVM itself and the benefits of using a JIT and having uh, ahead of time compilation and so on. But, you know, the idea that the JVM must only be used for Java, I think, is, is a bit of an oddity because it's used for a lot of different things. That said, I think Java will continue for a hell of a long time as a language on its own. Um, I think Scala possibly losing out somewhat to Kotlin. I think there's some displacement activity between the two, but the size of the Kotlin and Scala world is, is probably constant, if not growing slightly. But that being said, there will always be jobs for Scala people. I mean, Scala code, uh, like PHP, is a wonder to maintain. And I'm sure people are going to be able to create high paying careers from looking after that code. So I don't think it's ever going to go away. But, you know, I think the JVM and Java ecosystem is going to continue to grow and a rising tide lifts all the boat. Sorry, 
I think the um, the the changes that have been made to the the release um, cadence is I think is is gonna it is gonna help. I mean, I, we talk about Java not being as popular, but it depends what you mean by popular, right? It, it's you know, as Ben said, so many it, it, the numbers show how widely used it is. Um, but is it popular in the sense that it, it's you know the cool new thing all over the the press and all over the the uh, um, the internet? Um, you know, are the other languages like Kotlin and, Sc and Scala before it have have taken a lot of uh, a, a lot of column inches? Um, but the you know the the move to the six monthly release cadence, I think, is is helping with that. It, it's making more. Uh, uh, more of a noise in in the community. There's more interesting stuff coming out. And there's more new things for people to play with. I think all we need is for Brian Goats to say that semicolons at the end of the line are now optional, and Java's <laughs> popularity is just going to score. <laughs> for sure. I was actually going to ask us. Uh, I don't know if you can can comment or not, but like a large organisation like Morgan Stanley, of course, would probably look at language trends and developer productivity and, and make perhaps centralised sort of decisions on that sort of thing. Um, is that something that Morgan Stanley has ever looked at? Looked at Scala or Kotlin and said, "Hey, we we should evaluate this thing seriously because it's so far beyond Java in terms of its productivity." Um, we d we have a one of the larger Scala uh, code bases in the world, if not if not the larger one, uh, along with the vast amounts of of Java code. Um, so th it is something that that we we look at. Um, yeah, I, I think it's it, it it. I don't think you know Java is never going to go away. There are certain cases where w certain types of application that we like Scala for. Um, as, as an organization. Um, you know, other places, people tried it uh, and some are stepping back, some are investing more. Um, I think the, the interesting one with, with Kotlin is where it's, it's kind of gaining popularity is actually with Gradle, um, you know, as, as an, uh, an alternative to, to Groovy to, to write your, your build scripts. You have being able to uh, auto complete and uh, syntax highlighting and type safety in your build scripts. That's fantastic. Type safety, who would have thought it? <laughs> I would also just add just for we because I know we I know we only got about 10 minutes left, but I just I just wanted to um to come back and riff on riff on two things. Uh, firstly I want to pick up on something that Alex said, which is um uh about how the, the VM and the, the JDK and the and, and Java the language all support each other. One of the interesting ways you can see this is that um, sometimes features are implemented in Scala or Kotlin, which are not present in the Java language. And then when Java kind of catches up and, and gets there, what happens is the feature comes in, but it's not purely at language level. So I'm thinking about things like Scala's traits here, which um, prior to, to Scala 2.10, I think, um, were, were when it still supported Java 7. Um, they were actually implemented mostly in the Scala compiler. Um, but when they rebased onto only supporting Java 8, they could now mostly do Scala traits directly on top of Java interfaces because Java 8 gives you default methods. So unless you're explicitly carrying state in the Scala trait, you can now do it purely as, as an interface. Um, so these types of, of, of advances where a feature exists in another language but is only made up of some combination of compiler uh, and runtime support trickery versus that when Java finally implements a feature, other languages are able to rebaseline on top of it. Uh, and that's something which I think we're going we're gonna to see more of as time goes by. Um, and secondly, I was also just going to ask you to kind of look into the future and look into the crystal ball a little tiny bit and think about what might be delivered for Java 17. Um, so slowly, bit by bit, things have been being added. Uh, there's, there's been... Well, with Java 14, we get records as an experiment, as a, as a preview feature. And they're pretty close. They're pretty close, I would think, to what the final form of a record is going to look like. And for people that are programmed in other languages, you might have heard of things called algebraic data types. And records are Java's idea of what half of algebraic data types look like. So if you're, if you're familiar with Scala or Kotlin, in Scala, they're called match expressions. And they enable you to do pattern matching and destructuring and, and working with with com composite data types in a really different kind of way to the way that we're used to doing it in Java. All of that stuff is coming. 
And you know, if I was prepared to lay a modest sum of money on this, I would think that that is really what Java 17 looks like. That Java 17 code actually with, with type inference and var and with pattern matching and with a few other things which are in the pipeline from Project Amber, I think it's actually gonna, gonna do a lot to close the gaps with, with languages, especially like Kotlin. Scala, of course, has all that kind of higher order functional programming and higher kind of types and all that great stuff. But my gut feeling is that most developers don't actually want that. They want a Java plus plus rather than rather than anything which is really uh, Haskell on the JVM. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that's that's my sense, and I think that, I think Java seventeen is going to be a fantastic language to program in personally. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it myself, and I haven't got a PhD in category theory, so I stayed well away from Scala. Uh, as, as much as because some of the shouting in the community about category theory is about anything else. I think the one I'm holding out for, uh, I'm looking forward to in, uh, in 17 is the uh, helpful null pointer exception, which I think is going to make a lot of us a lot less sweary when we're programming. Yeah, that was actually, that was a fascinating change to watch going to OpenJDK because there were yeah. lots of solutions out there which were very kind of language level and very surface level, but the fact that the SAP engineer went deep diving to the JVM itself and does a real surgery to make this work and work efficiently because that, that's the problem right when you start pulling up stack stack yeah. traces and stack frames it gets horribly expensive and yeah that was what seemed like a really simple patch turned out to be a herculean effort so um yeah, i'm glad i didn't have to do it and i'm really looking forward to using it yeah uh, and now all I, have, all I have to do is accept my patch to call it a null reference exception and <laughs> i can retire <laughs> happy days Okay, so I think, I think we're coming up to time now, guys. So thank you very much, everyone on the panel. Um, I was gonna just finish with one final question, which will be uh, more of a competition uh, to see what the lowest version of Java people have spotted running in production is recently. Um, so yeah, well, what do you reckon? Have we got any, any one falls <laughs> or less? I, I can go lower than that. <laughs> We, uh, I will not confirm or deny which organization I've seen this running at, but uh, there is some Java 1.2 running out there, which I've had to recently deal with. Um, you know, hardware devices, right? If it works, it works. You don't, you don't, you don't shift that Java off. Awesome. Well, thanks very much, everyone. And, and thanks for all our attendees as well. Barry, Dead, if you want to say a few final words. Yeah, just just to say thank you to uh, to everyone for signing up, and um, and uh, Ben, uh, Elspeth, Martin, and, and Alex, and of course Jim for um, for hosting the panel. Um, really appreciate it. I hope you're enjoying these these virtual events. Uh, we're we're keen to do what you guys want us to do. So I'm going to uh, get out a a feedback form, <clears throat> uh, either myself or, um, or or one of the rec workers. Anyway, I'll get out a feedback form later today. Please let us know if there's any event that you want to hear about. Um, any topic, anything, anyone in particular you'd like to hear more from or, or anything like that, or just to shower Jim with praise for, um, for the hosting he's done today, um, then, then please do so. Um, and yeah, like, just, just, just come back and, and, and keep us posted. Let us know what you like. But thanks, everyone, for, for getting involved. And thanks to the, uh, the panel.